is up everybody welcome back to another video in today's video we are back with another episode of lions latest going through the latest detroit lions news day 11 of lions training camp is in the books as well as this is lions football week the detroit lions take on the atlanta falcons friday at 6 p.m eastern time to open up their preseason football is here it's back so let's get it started fired up it's made a great decision Great teammates, coaches, and other people who want to be Super Bowl champions. And we are. We're going to do it this year. And we're going places because we want to go places. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Before long, where are they going to be the last one standing? Welcome everybody to my video. Glad you guys are here and we are back with another Lions latest episode. Today we have a couple of roster moves to discuss as well as some updates from Detroit Lions day 11 of training camp. This is week three I believe of Lions training camp. We only have two days left open to the public tomorrow and Wednesday. After that it's done. It's off to get ready to the, for the season and the Lions said Dan Campbell said that they're not going to worry about the Atlanta Falcons until Thursday when they start discussing what they're going to see from Atlanta but it's preseason. He said we're focused on the Lions but that's where we're at right now getting ready for the season Friday we have Lions football and it sounds like we're going to see some of the starters on Friday so definitely tune into that game because if we do see starters on Friday we likely won't see them for the rest of the preseason so that's the game to watch for sure that being said we also have hard knocks taking place tomorrow it's very likely that I will not be you know like live streaming for the reaction of that we'll see if we do anything for the reaction of hard knocks but I just want to put it out there that hard knocks is premiering tomorrow for the Detroit Lions that's going to be something that's you know talked about across many networks is the Detroit Lions hard knocks well with that being said let's dive into the participation report for the Detroit Lions some injury updates some roster moves we'll dive into what Dan Campbell told us as well as some of the notes that we have from practice today now unfortunately practice was closed to the public due to weather I think they still actually practiced outside but it was closed earlier due to weather so that being said these are not my notes from training camp but I do plan on being back there tomorrow with my own notes so with all that being said Let's dive into these participation updates. All right, starting off at the top, we have the pup list. No changes. Josh Pascal, Jason Cabinda, Jerry Jacobs, Romeo Quora. No updates on those guys either at this point, as well as Jamison Williams being on the NFI list. Moving ahead of that, we know C.J. Moore is back. I just want to leave that on there for another day. C.J. Moore is back. Great news there. Quintez Cephas, the only update we have is that the Lions are optimistic with Quintez Cephas' is injury. But no participation today at practice for Quintez Cephas. No participation for Levi Onzerike. Now, I don't even know if he was actually there today. I do wonder a little bit about that. It sounds like he probably wasn't there today. But for the last week, back really about a week now, I don't think we've seen Levi at all. I remember asking at the beginning of last week, like, hey, has anybody seen Levi? And it was like, no, we haven't seen Levi at all. So this is one that we're kind of in the dark on. We really don't know much about Levi other than the fact that Dan Campbell said he was a little bit banged up and they're trying to be smart with him. So I don't know what the timeline is there with Levi, but we're definitely hoping for the best. We want to see that guy get back on the field for sure. And also Julian Okwara, who's been out the last couple of days. We did see him at the Family Fest, I believe, off on the sideline, sitting on the bench without pads on. So hopefully that's nothing too serious, but no participation from Julian. Julian. Now, a couple of other like new additions that maybe we weren't anticipating. Ify and Josh Johnson were not in pads today. Ify being the safety, Josh Johnson being the UDFA signing out of Tulsa. So we'll keep our eyes on those two injuries as well. I feel like Josh Johnson's he's made some plays for sure in training camp. And of course, if you're making this transition, you want to get him as many reps as possible. However, we're not for sure it's an injury because they were out there at practice. They were just not in pads today. So we'll see if there's any news that comes with that. The good news is, is that Ryan McCollum and Jeff Okuda return to practice. Ryan McCollum, who was our third string center last season behind Evan Brown, as well as Jeff Okuda. He said he looks good. It was just a day off for him. There's no concern about the Achilles injury. Moving well, he looks good athletically. But with that said, they understand that he needs reps because even even though this guy's been in the league for now three seasons, this is his third year, he really hasn't played that much. Most in his rookie season, but he didn't play the entire season. He missed a lot of time that year as well. It was cut short. The next season, of course, last year ended one game into the year, and now you're trying to kind of work him back from that injury. So they understand that he just needs reps. He needs opportunity, and it starts with being healthy. Taylor Decker, DeAndre Swift, sounds like they had one of their normal rest days. A couple guys on here before, like Hawkinson and Ragnow, who are no longer on here. I believe they were on here for rest days, Jay Sean Cornell. So that's good news. And then at the bottom, we have a couple of roster notes to mention. First off, I, I really hate to say it, man. I cannot pronounce this guy's name. I've heard it as Zane Obine, so I'm going to rock with that. But you guys see it. That was the undrafted free agent signing the guard out of Ferris State, who has been placed on the reserve retired list. 
Actually, the first game I ever watched was with my cousins. It was a Monday night football game with the Lions against the Bears. And then that was like my first time watching football and I fell in love with, uh, with it since then. Dream come true, you know, I mean, this opportunity is everything. It's a blessing. Dan Campbell was asked about this and he just said, you know what, everybody's different. Uh, he understood why the question was asked because there has been multiple players that haven't placed on his list. But he said three of those four players, you would have never guessed that they would, you know, basically be put on this list, basically retire. You would have never guessed that they would have done that. It's not for everyone, like Dan Campbell says, going through kind of, I guess you could say maybe the, the off season grind every day, you know, to be a part of this, but it is a little bit concerning, but because we don't really know their reasoning behind retiring, but at the same time, as always, wishing him the best of luck. He joins Corey Sutton, Jermaine Waller on this list, as well as John Penasini. But I, I feel like his probably had something to do with the injuries. But again, I'm not trying to speculate with John Penasini. That one happened back before really this training and everything started. Tag in case the Detroit Lions quickly made another move. And this was another signing as the roster spot opened up. And this was to sign offensive tackle Kendall Lamb. I believe I'm pronouncing that last name right. Kendall Lamb from the Tennessee Titans, who is a 30-year-old offensive tackle. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is some news that really got me excited because of the fact that I'm not completely confident with what we have at the backup tackle position. Of course, we signed UDFA Obina Eze this offseason, who I was really hoping you know could really show some things. But to this point, it seems like he is behind guys like Dan Skipper, still Matt Nelson. He is getting reps at both left tackle and right tackle. But according to Dan Campbell, he needs to kind of learn to become a pro. His, condition, his NFL conditioning, he needs to be in NFL shape. He's like, man, I like his length, his athleticism, and he can have a future with us if that is the case but it doesn't seem so far from what we've seen that he's in a spot where it's going to be like yeah we trust him to back up at tackle and be a swing tackle for us meanwhile it's kind of been dan skipper and matt nelson holding down the top two offensive tackles positions and there's definitely legitimate concern there for me it was one of my biggest concerns heading into the offseason that i thought the lions should address this i thought they should have drafted an offensive tackle i thought they needed an offensive tackle because last year when they lost taylor decker it was a huge detriment to our team we really hurt our offense we talk all about the receivers but the pass protection took such a dip such a massive dip when that happened not when frank got hurt when we lost our offensive tackle it took such a massive dip in terms of just the, the, the statistics the pressures we allowed was ridiculous this was a position i thought the lions should have addressed they did not address it and with that being said, the Lions are trying to add a little more competition, it sounds like, as Dan Campbell said today, he will compete in that room. The good thing is, that I like, is that this is a veteran. He's been in the league. He played 850-some snaps in 2018 for the Houston Texans. He also signed to a little, pretty nice deal with the Tennessee Titans, but he was released as a cap casualty, as it sounds like he was injured in training camp. But a guy that was brought in originally to compete with Dylan Radins, if you remember him, coming out of the draft, for the right tackle position, he dealt with an injury in training camp, and he basically became the third-string offensive tackle. He has been released from the Tennessee Titans in March of 2022 as a cap casualty because he was signed to a two-year four and a half million dollar deal which is not a bad contract it's a nice little contract to a potential backup swing tackle and I say swing tackle because he played right tackle for Houston but he also played some left tackle for Tennessee when we did see him in the small amounts in 2021 so when I see this I'm excited because I think this could be some very legitimate competition and I still think we need to figure out who is who can be a swing tackle for us because I don't think we have a guy right now that we feel confident could be a swing tackle for us. We have guys that we like in certain spots. Matt Nelson, we like him as a sixth offensive lineman. I think they'll use him as a right tackle. But in the case of not having Decker, they're not putting Matt Nelson at left tackle and allowing, you know, Penny Sewell to stick at right tackle, which is understandable because left tackle, I mean, it's the position that, hey, it's the blind side. You got to protect that. So with that being said, maybe the Lions can find a little bit more of a swing tackle potentially with this addition. But I do watch this film of him, and I'm going to have to dive deeper into this. But what I've seen so far, very quick feet. He also has an extremely, extremely quick and explosive get off when he needs to utilize that get off. He has some very nice hip flexibility, some agile feet to really mirror potentially in pass protection. He did look a little bit better, I would say, at left tackle in 2021 than I thought that he did in 2018. Consistency in terms of hands placement is his consistency in terms of balance, which seemed to give him in trouble in terms of double moves. It allowed him to open up, you know, open up the gate a little bit to the inside and allow pass rush for rushers that started outside and broke back inside. 
From the very little that I've seen on this player, he's built more like a Taylor Decker than an Obina Eze. He doesn't have the longest arms. He has to lean a little bit more on his agility and quick feet. He does seem to struggle a little bit with balance at the top of the pass rush, you know, when it comes to some of the side steps and things like that. Just staying, you know, squatted, not getting straight up where he can be ran over. Hand consistency, hand placement does seem to be a little bit of an issue as well. Again, from the little that I've seen. But when he does get that good base under him, he does show some power. He's utilizing some power rush schemes as well. Um, and then it's just giving up the inside as well. And it seems to be at the top when guys are getting up on his toes. He would allow inside pass rush. He does seem to have legitimate power, especially with the Titans that did a lot of power rushing schemes where he could get under, get in your chest, and really plow you back in some of like you know some of your power rushing schemes that he was utilized in. It was just important that he got a really good base under him, being that he's six foot five, three hundred and ten pounds, the former UDFA out of App State. So I'm at to watch more of the guy. But I am excited that the Lions made this addition. Last season, he only played 87 snaps, where Pro Football Focus gave him a 46.9 as an overall grade, 46.7 against in pass protection, a 57.3 against the run. However, historically, if you look at all of his PFF grades, they actually graded him out pretty darn well as a pass protector. Specifically, in 2018, when he played over 800 snaps at right tackle, he was given a 64.4 overall, 75.2 in pass protection, and a 51 Point four in run blocking. Put that into context, that would have been a better pass blocking grade than Penny Sewell had last season that he had in 2018. Now, of course, that doesn't really say everything because you have to watch how are they protecting him, right? Are they sliding protection help his way? And they did that a lot. Also, the run blocking from what I've seen so far definitely did look inconsistent, but he showed ability to move in a zone blocking scheme, get off the line with the first step, and at the same time, utilize power if he gets a good base and he's able to sink into his blocks. Otherwise, there definitely could be inconsistency. I think the competition was necessary now let's dive into some of these notes that dan campbell gave us and we'll probably come back to that signing because i really want to look into it i may end up doing a breakdown on the player i just don't i want to save that because this video is gonna be super long if i try to do that here but that is something i want to look into because you guys know how much i wanted the lions to get a backup offensive tackle so for me i'm just super excited to see the news that the lions had that on their mind and i'm sure they've seen it in practice i thought there have been some issues with the second unit and a second string offensive tackle so far from what we've seen that guys have given them some problems that the Lions do that, hey, it probably wouldn't be hurt to address this and add some more competition to this unit because, again, Obina Eze could be nice for the future, but we're talking this year. We need to have a guy that can protect as a backup that you're somewhat confident in where your offense doesn't completely change this season. He was asked about Demetrius Taylor, who he said, Demetrius Taylor, he flashes every day. He plays with great leverage. He has a great first step, but he does need to improve his anchor, specifically against double team blocks, which is an area where he has to be perfect because of his size. He's only 290, but he is six foot one, which is pretty darn short for a defensive lineman. We just took it off and swam in that 6'5", and he has that natural leverage that Demetrius Taylor has, where he's consistently playing under your pads. You see it back in college, his ability to get to the backfield with the first step, the ability that he brought across the defensive line, and I think the first major flash that I saw was at the Family Fest, when he ended up getting what could have been a sack on a stunt, which definitely is an area that he can be utilized because of the athleticism that he has. Speaking of the preseason, he did say that he wanted to see the starters. He's going to meet with the staff and talk about how much they really want to see them but he said about a, about the first quarter, which last year I think was two drives, they were done, and that was it for the preseason. But he said you can't mimic game speed. He said you can't mimic game speed, and that's what they you know want to get some opportunity to see their guys against. Now, they will have the joint practices against Indianapolis, but again, it's still not the same thing. But it is nice to have that because last year, if you remember, they didn't get signed up in time for any joint practices. So he's asked about Jared Davis, and he called Jared Davis a pro's pro, a guy that just comes to life, and he's always asking for more. He's like a second-year player in terms of he's just always asking for more things, more more things to be put on his plate more opportunity but he said he is a pros pro right now and he's always trying to get smarter he's trying to understand the game the mental side of the game even more still even though he's been in the league for how long that he's been in the league interesting he did talk specifically about the kicker battle and he did say straight up that right now he said the edge would be given to austin cyber right austin cyber is leading the way as of right now it's funny because i didn't see that before me and rad did our 53 you know kind of update and i had cybered over riley patterson part of that is yeah he just hit a 62 yard field goal which is out outstanding but at the same time I feel like it's been relatively balanced in practice and I don't think Austin Cybers looked bad especially when he goes off and he just kicks on his own you can see the massive leg that he has but I think it's been pretty even there it's not like a spot where it's like hey Riley Patterson you didn't win the job you're out of here as he says for Austin Cyber, it is really nice to have a guy that you feel like hey in some of those situational drills as long as we get it to like the 42 43 we got a shot which would be a 59 60 yard field goal 
But he said with Riley Patterson, you get him inside, you know, 50, I think he said 50 yards, maybe 40 yards. He said that dude is money. He said he's money. And that's a really nice thing to have as well, that consistency. Last year, Austin Seibert, 12 of 14. Riley Patterson, I believe he was 15 of 16 with his one miss as his longest field goal attempt. But we did see Riley Patterson yesterday at the Family Fest miss both of his long kicks. First one, he pushed it right. Second one, he kicked it short. Meanwhile, Austin Seibert knocked both of them down, including a 62-yard field goal, which was bounced in off the bottom and in. Seibert has the better leg. Riley Patterson has shown to be very consistent uh, inside and he also feels like uh, Austin Seibert looked good on the kickoff drills that they gave him as last year that was Jack Fox this year it sounds like their kickers are going to be handling that responsibility and he said right now he likes what Seibert did better also keep in mind Austin Seibert's the guy that got us the onside back against San Francisco so just keep that in mind too because he was the kicker at that spot as well but either way he said Jack Fox kind of like that you know insurance for us that we do have if we never ever needed a guy that could help us kick off he did talk about Malcolm Rodriguez, and he praised Malcolm Rodriguez big time today. He said this. He said, Malcolm Rodriguez, his awareness, his instincts. He said, look, when you have that, when you have the, the motor that that guy has, he says, you can grow pretty fast in this league. And right now, he's getting opportunities to mix in with the ones, which has been the case for a while now. We've talked about that. He's mixing higher reps, and he continues to make flash plays. I think Dan Campbell's coming around to it. The way that he said, hey, look, those guys can develop really fast. I know I heard when Brett, when they said, hey, this is a good special teams player for us when they drafted him. I was taken aback a little bit because I'm like, special teams player? This guy's going to he's gonna play. Like, a special team, he watched his film? Like, I know they watched their film, of course. But now they're starting to see it in training camp. Seems like he's in a good spot right now, and they have given some love to that man, Malcolm Rodriguez. As we always say, it's just a matter of time. That's all it is. Just, that's all it is for him. Now, the notes that we have from Detroit Lions training camp, again, these are not my notes, but they are places, they have notes that I've gathered from different areas across the internet, so shout out to them. I will give some credit as we go through this. But with that being said, let's dive into some of the notes. Doesn't sound like there was a lot of 11 on 11. Sounds like it was a lot of one on ones, running backs versus linebackers, wide receivers versus DBs, lighter practice today. Sounds like it was still outside, but just a lighter practice day to day. So tomorrow they'll probably ramp it up a little bit more. No, no, we'll have to see how they play out this week, knowing that they have a game this week. But he said it wasn't going to be any different. He's focusing on the Lions. A couple notes that we have. First off, from some of the one-on-one -on -one drills, both, well, from the different sources that I've seen, is that they credited Tracy Walker for how well he did in the one-on-one, -on -one, saying that he did four reps and he won every single rep, including having a pass breakup against Hawkinson, uh, forcing an incomplete pass against Derek Deese Jr., and having one pass breakup against Devin Funches and another incomplete pass against Devin Funches, winning all four of his reps. Now, I told you guys, back in one of our other training game videos i think tracy walker has looked so much improved in man coverage so much improved in man coverage where that's an emphasis that was coming into last year you saw him taking extra reps off to the side with aaron glenn with those coaches hey get extra works on one-on-one -on -one by yourself everybody else doing team drills we need to get you some extra works one-on-one -on -one because we want to make sure that you can cover and he took a massive jump to the point where now we're looking at him saying man that guy can really cover at safety we know he can hit we know he'll play downhill if he brings the coverage element, specifically man-to-man, -man, that allows a lot of versatility. Sounds like Deshaun Elliott didn't really have the same day, which has kind of been the case as well in training camp, so I believe that 100%. Kirby Joseph, we know, brings a big-time coverage element because his background playing receiver, but also just what he was at college, his coverage upside, his athleticism, his fluidness, his also ability to play deep safety. He brings that as well, but Deshaun Elliott did have a pick at the Family Fest, but I think it was kind of a sack, so it didn't really count. The point is, though, sounds like Tracy Walker had a great day today on one-on-ones. Maybe not anticipated to that level, but it's definitely great to hear because he has been taking massive strides, specifically in coverage. It also sounds like in the linebacker versus running back drills, Alex Anzalone had a really good coverage rep against Jamar Jefferson, while at the same time, Craig Reynolds seemed to shine, beating, winning a couple of his reps. And, man, people forget because he looks, he looks like this stocky first, second down back. But it's easy to forget how dynamic he was coming out of college, how big of a weapon he was in his receiving back coming out of college at cuts down, how just big of a playmaker he was out of the backfield. He was such a big playmaker there. People seem to forget that just because of his build. But as the season went on, as he continued to get reps, he started to see some opportunities in the pass-catching side against Atlanta. Well, if the Lions could trust him in pass pro and he's making plays in practice, slowly that role is going to continue to develop to the point where right now he seems firmly as the number three running back. Apparently, Amani had a really rough uh, day today in terms of one-on-one, -on -one, which isn't completely surprising, but at the same time, because again, I don't think he's the most sticky corner, especially at the top of a route. I think he's pretty 
he, he fits certain schemes well and he has some very big strengths but he also has some you know obvious weaknesses when you watch him in terms of stickiness and man coverage because one-on-ones usually favor the offense there's really not much leverage you can point to unless they're by a sideline and there's no help that you can force him back to inside so you're straight up they know it's man coverage you're covering that guy so can you do it sounds like he had a rough day today but Jeff Okuda had a little bit better of a day as he had uh, one pass that he was in coverage on that he won against DJ Chark. However, the other two, DJ Chark won those reps, beating him on a post route and a double move. DJ Chark, man, ooh, he is he is starting to take off, right? You saw flashes early in camp, but he is starting to take off and come into his own. But Jeff Okuda, again, no surprise to me, pure man-to-man -man coverage. Okuda healthy? I would take Okuda all day. But Okuda needs that development. So I think he could be super good this season because he, he has the fluidity, the ability at his size and length to really be an issue. He just needs to polish up some of the areas that he really has seemed to struggle at, finishing certain plays, finishing at the catch point, biting on certain things. There's just little techniques and things that he needs to get cleaned up, which is why I think Dan Campbell says the guy needs reps. He needs to be in the situation. I mean, you could be athletic and all these things and all this potential, but you got to play, man. It's been three years, and he hasn't really played that much. He needs to get snapped. 11 on 11s. I guess golf only threw five passes. Sounds like that's all he needed. He went four for five. Only incomplete pass with a pass batted down at the line of scrimmage, including shot plays to Amon Ross St. Brown, DJ Chark. Proud of Detroit said that three of the four completions were 20-plus yards. Guys, what else, what else do I need to say to let you know that shot plays are a thing right now? And on top of that, when I hear that Amon Ross St. Brown deep down the left sideline, G.J. Chark deep down the sideline, it's like, dude, that's the, they have taken win outside the numbers to another level this offseason. Just winning vertical. Getting together with him as far okay. as personnel-wise. Um, you know, Brad told me early on in the spring, man, we're going to go get you some weapons. And, Got it. and, you know, obviously they've done that. And, mm -hmm. and Dan's the same way with just telling me that he believes in me. And, you know, we, we're going to do this for you. We're going to get this right. We're going to do this. And yeah. Awesome. It, it makes you feel good, right? Um, but schematically, it's, it's, it's with Ben, and, and, and the job he's done has been tremendous, and him wanting my input has been the coolest part. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I'm at a point in my career where I can, I can say something and stand behind it and, and know that um, what I'm saying ain't, uh, ain't a guess. You know, right. I, I know, I know what I'm saying, I know what I mean, um, and I think he respects that. One-on-one, -on -one, give him a chance. Josh Reynolds has been dominant in this area. St. Brown is now mixing in and starting to get into the action on the outside, which is really the first time I saw that was the Family Fest, and it was like, whoa, hold the dub, that was St. Brown. On Will Harris, what? And we know DJ Chark has been dominant there for, for, for a while now. He's, he's been very dominant there for a while now. And Goff seems to have the utmost trust and confidence in him. It looks like what it looked like as soon as Josh Reynolds came in the building. That's what it looks like right now, in my opinion, even though I didn't see it today, but from what I've seen with DJ Chark and Jared Goff. Our goal is firstly to win the division and then compete in the playoffs for a championship. And I know that's always you say that around here and people are like, oh, you know, what do you, you know, but no, that's internally that is our goal. We feel like we've put some pieces in place and um, have the coaches in place. We feel good about Brad, obviously, and everything that they've done in the off season. But it's 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 time, you know. It's 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 time to go. And um, I think if I've learned anything is that you 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 think you have time, but you don't. Yep. You think you got time. You think you got. Oh no, we'll get another chance at this. No, you got you got to go right now, and we got to go fast. Now the second team offense sounds like today they went with Tim Boyle. So they continue to rotate those two, and I'm just waiting. I just want to hear him find some sort of a rhythm offensively. I want to see that. It doesn't sound like we got really any notes from that second unit of offense, but that is an area that I'm looking for is for him to find some of the rhythm because, again, I think it could be put out there like Tim Boyle's is completely, you know, he's not doing anything well. Like, that's not the case. It's just that, to me, David Blau has found more consistency and somewhat of a rhythm in this offense where Tim Boyle just a little bit more sporadic. He'll give you some good reps. He'll give you some really nice throws. And you're like, oh, there it is, Tim. And then he'll come back and he'll make, a really bad throw and you're like man it just threw off the rhythm completely hasn't seemed to find it within this offense and I'm sure today being a shorter light of practice probably was really tough to gauge that anyway but they did pride of Detroit shot to them they did bring up some of the personnel groupings that was Okuda and Hughes at outside cornerback it sounds like he's now becoming that as the Lions are like okay hey, look Chase Lucas you're playing slot Mike Hughes we're gonna kick you outside I mean it just is what it is he's probably gonna make the team just based on a lot of his contract but at the same time we didn't know where he's going to play inside, outside, but Chase Lucas has now done really well at slot. So, look, let's just move you outside. Let's start getting those reps now. Chase Lucas being in the slot makes a ton of sense. Man, I really like that lineup, though. 
I really do. Like, even if that was take Okuda out and put Will Harris there, that cornerback, like, for backups in terms of having Okuda and Amani as one and two, but then being able to rotate with a Will Harris and a Mike Hughes and a Chase Lucas, I feel really good about that depth, man. I just do, just seeing the players individually. On hearing that, it sounds like Mark Gilbert possibly then bumped down, so they put Mike Hughes on the outside, and that's probably where it's leaning right now in terms of if you're betting on who's going to make the team, is that's how it would go. Meanwhile, not really knowing where Jerry Jacobs is at, if he comes in on the pup list, then, of course, that opens a spot, and there you could have six cornerbacks, including A.J., and then a safety because, of course, there was no iffy. They had Kirby Joseph and Juju Hughes who continues to mix in. No one's talking about that guy. But hearing that, it sounds like C.J. Moore was not in those, even though I don't know if he's working in team drills yet. So let me just say that. I'm not sure if he's even doing that yet. Then at linebacker, they had Malcolm and Shawnee and Hamilton. They continue to rotate that. It sounds like the first unit was probably Derek Barnes and Alex. So the second unit was now Sean Deon Hamilton. He flashed a lot last training camp, but it continues to be a battle with him, Chris Board, guys like that. But the consistent is Malcolm Rodriguez continues to work his way up. It continues to flash, and the Lions are really liking him. And as Aaron Glenn told us last year, don't be afraid to play the young guys. Don't be afraid to play the rookies. I'm going to definitely be watching for Chris Board to see where he is like amongst guys like Jared Davis. He seems to be losing possibly a little bit of steam. It doesn't seem like he is afraid to do that. Meanwhile, we were noted that Jamal Williams did beat Josh Woods and he let everybody know about it. So, all right. On special teams, apparently Maurice Alexander continues to get reps there. He continues to look good. Chase Lucas got a rep on a punt return. And he was tackled by Scott Daly? Chase, come on, man. I'm trying to hype you up. You got there by Scott Daly? Anyway, the point is... Jamar Jefferson also continues to get love in this area where Dan Campbell has already praised him. I think he will end up making the roster. I think he's running back four right now. I think I'm getting a clearer picture on how this plays out. I may throw it up on the screen, kind of what I'm thinking. This is not my 53-man roster projection, but it's just kind of the, the, I, the feel that I sort of have from the days that I've seen now so far through training camp, how it's adjusted, how it's changed. This is definitely just a rough copy. I mean, if I really went through this, I'd probably change it up, probably adjust it because I don't have Godwin on here, and I really feel weird. I feel naked not putting Godwin on here who is our kick returner who was a good kick returner last season I really feel weird not doing that so definitely feels sort of strange about some of the, like having Austin Bryan on here because I'm just not sure how this all plays out in terms of the depth side of things but at the same time when I see certain guys and, and, and you can see the bubble and things the guys that I think are close but I, I still I feel like Blouse had the better training camp so far, but it wouldn't shock me uh, if the Lions went with Boyle because I don't think it's been like a landslide. I just feel like he's had a better training camp up to this point, but preseason's probably going to tell a lot there. But it does seem like Lions would still probably have in their eyes Boyle as the number two. And then I also look at guys like Isaiah Bugs, who I'm not completely confident about putting there. Austin Bryant, I like it, but I'm not completely confident about. Jared Davis, I think Anthony Pittman could be right there. Now Sean Dean Hamilton. I mean, that one's completely up in the air to me with that position. But just kind of how I'm feeling now a little bit since the days I've seen it. This is before I heard of today's practice, so obviously that would change things. Either way, though, let me know your thoughts, comments below. Hard Knocks is on tomorrow for Detroit Lions. It's that time. If you haven't seen the Jamal Williams hype up videos, check them out. You might cry a little bit, but that's okay. That's what it's about. It's Lions football. It is Monday, Friday. Lions, Falcons. Football's back. Your thoughts, comments below. Thank you for watching, and I'm out.